Well, I've actually like laid on this bed with a lot of people. So. Oh yeah. It's, You're a this, frequent experimenter with horizontality. Well, <laughs> this is where we do our sessions. Sex positive culture. It's my body to give. Are threesome gifts a thing? Taking a bra off. I like your bed. Horizontal. 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 This is horizontal with Lila. I'm Lila, and I am horizontal in Austin, Texas. And I am Epiphany Jordan, and I am lying here with the lovely Miss Lila. Hello, dear one. Welcome back to Horizontal, the podcast of intimacies recorded while lying down, sharing a single pillow, and wearing robes. If you've ever watched slow TV, this is like slow radio. It's the stories around a campfire, stargazing on the top of a hill, post-coital tangled in the sheets, dinner party after three glasses of wine when everyone leans back, loosens their belt, and drifts towards the couches, kind of aural experience. My intention is to make private conversations public, in service of dispelling shame, diminishing loneliness, and inspiring human connection. This week and next week's episodes are the last ones recorded on my Horizontal Does America tour, which took place last year, October and November of 2017. Lucid Studios NYC kindly provided a car, and I went on a solo road trip adventure, circumnavigating the U.S., covering 10,700 miles, and recording with people in their homes, in their cities, and often in their beds. We recorded this episode in Austin, Texas, in a color-saturated cottage sanctuary filled with art and altars called the Blue Star Temple. In this episode, I lie down with Epiphany Jordan. Epiphany is a nurturer by trade, a professional cuddler, a.k.a. the chief oxytocin provider of Karuna Sessions, described as the Rolls-Royce of cuddling experiences. It's a two-on-one deep-dive immersion in mothering energy and loving touch. Her forthcoming book, Somebody Hold Me, The Single Person's Guide to Nurturing Human Touch, will be out over the next few months. Keep your eye out for its release by going to the website somebodyhold.me. You can also find her on karunasessions.com, K-A-R-U-N-A sessions.com, and bluestartemple.com. Epiphany is a reader of the tarot, proprietress of the Blue Star Temple guest house and sanctuary space. We recorded this episode there, and I can attest to the coziness, color therapy, and great good juju of the place. At Blue Star Temple, Epiphany offers services like cross-dress for success, design a ritual, and the iconically titled Sanctuary. I love that she offers sanctuary as a service. We could all use some sanctuary. Don't you agree? In this part of our conversation, we discuss Epiphany's Muslim slash Jewish slash Catholic upbringing, being a sexual rebel in Reno, Nevada in the 1970s, the cyclical nature of sexual mores, society's touch deficit, and my complicated relationship with my mother and my mother's touch. If you enjoy lying down with us and believe in my mission to spread intimacy across the globe, here's how you can make sure that this podcast remains ad-free and remains a podcast. Become a patron of the Horizontal Arts. Patreon is the love child of a subscription service and crowdfunding. You offer a monthly contribution and you get a level of special access to me and my work. Beginning over the next couple of weeks, there's going to be a change in the way Horizontal is released. The second part of my conversation with each guest will be gated, meaning roughly every other episode will be free and every other episode will be paid. But all episodes will always be available to patrons at $5 a month on up. So, fair warning, if you wish, you can download all the episodes now while you can, 
and become a $5 a month patron for full access going forward. Thanks to my newest patrons, Evan, Melanie, Mark, Christopher, Antonio, and Rex, I'm now halfway towards breaking even on the current podcast expenses. Yay! After breaking even, the next goal is to hire a transcriptionist. I've been painstakingly transcribing my show notes by hand in order to create gorgeous, informative, and accessible to differently abled folks blog posts. And psst, you can get my writing and photos and links to the blog posts in your inbox weekly by signing up on horizontalwithlila.com and adding Lila at horizontalwithlila.com to your address book. Okay, sometimes it's semi-weekly. I haven't put one out in a few weeks. I'm getting on it. Since I'm both unskilled in transcription and extraordinarily meticulous, each set of show notes takes me about 10 to 12 hours to put together. When I hire someone, 90% of those hours will be freed up to conduct more recorded conversations, offer more live events, and create more horizontal goodness for you. And just before we dive into the episode, I want to make this super clear. A lot of my friends have told me that they've been hesitant to become my patrons because they feel embarrassed to only be able to give $2 a month. Oh my goodness. If everybody who loves the podcast or my writing became a patron at $2 a month, it would change my life. Every patron is so incredibly valuable to me. And the beauty of crowdfunding is precisely this, that when many people give a little bit, it adds up appreciably. And with each new patron, I can feel how many people out there believe in me and my mission to spread intimacy across the globe. Plus, I do a happy dance each time. So go to patreon.com slash horizontal with Lila. It's spelled P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com. You can also follow the link in my Instagram bio that reads patron of the horizontal arts. And now, darling, come lie down with us in Austin, Texas. So it's actually usually three people on the bed. Three? Yeah. Okay, I can't wait to hear about that. Yeah. I have done an episode with my housemate who's a professional cuddler. Uh Uh-huh. And then I recorded with Marsha B. as well when I was in and read. Mm Mm-hmm. So I am so excited to hear about your version. Yeah, mine's mine's different, yeah. This, we are in a little annex home temple place where all the walls are colorful. On the right is it? is a green wall on the left is it is uh, it's not teal it's turquoise Turquoise. wall we've got a yellow wall across from us there's colorful art everywhere it's an extremely inspiring environment it feels really peaceful feels like a lot of comfort has been had here absolutely (laughs) yeah i can feel it it's really lovely thank you yeah i've worked on it for Several years, and I've, I'm pleased with how it's turned out. You mentioned that uh, it caused a great rift. Yeah, uh, my ex-husband and I started remodeling this together, and it destroyed our relationship, as many house remodels do. It's not an uncommon scenario. <sighs> it makes sense, but it's also so preposterous i mean it's 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 just a how it is you know it's a huge undertaking and so many decisions have to be made but but it's a house does it have to ruin otherwise lovely relationships well i think the house was a catalyst it wasn't necessarily there were underlying problems as as it was before Mm. and uh the situation just exacerbated it so it just brings out calls to light the already existing issues in a partnership absolutely and like any collaboration does right although i would i would even go as far as to say that if you really want to test your relationship you should remodel a house with somebody (laughs) 
<laughs> that's, that's like what they say about if you want to test your serenity, go visit your family. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> if you think you're enlightened. If you think you're enlightened, go yeah, visit go your spend family. your weekend with your family. <laughs> yeah, that was Ram Dass. <laughs> or I've also heard family is the master class, and I'm like, oh, I fail the master I fail the master class. <laughs> <laughs> I, I do pretty well with it. I... <laughs> so what was your family like growing up? Oh, my goodness. I always win the family, crazy family award. Um, oh, I can't wait. <laughs> <laughs> so my father was Muslim. He was born in India. And when he was about a year old, he moved to South Africa. His whole family emigrated to South Africa. And he had about a third grade education and started educating himself by reading books. And when he, he was in his 20s, he got a scholarship and went to college in Ohio. And then he went back to South Africa for a little while, still under apartheid and Indians were considered, they called them Asians, but you know, they had a lot of the same restrictions as blacks did. So he came back to the United States and ended up doing his graduate degree at USC. My mother is half Catholic and half Jewish. She was born in Palestine because her father was a Jewish agitator in Vienna and he almost got caught by the Nazis and decided to flee. So they spent the war in Palestine and then they went back to Vienna after the war was over. And he, oh, she, excuse me, uh, they're, all of my grandfather's brothers and sisters ended up emigrating to the United States as well. And uh, my parents met at USC and uh, got married. Both of them were college professors. And when I was about three years old, we moved to Reno, which is where I grew up. And I did a fairly, had a pretty cultured growing up. Uh, we went to Europe frequently to visit my grandparents and a lot of theater and museums and house full of books my dad had a crazy library and uh so I got a lot of pretty interesting experiences as a child and in that what did you learn about sex and touch <laughs> <laughs> uh, my family was fairly affectionate and while my neither of my parents raised me in their religions my my mother went to Catholic school, but she's fairly agnostic. She just doesn't have a lot of uh, need, need. She just doesn't have a lot of need for religion or spirituality in her life. My father, on the other hand, was a very devout Muslim. And while he did not raise me as a Muslim, I got all of the negative cultural shaming and sex was kind of my form of rebellion as a, as a teenager. Um, I had a lot of sex just as a way of acting out and it was not all that pleasant it was it was pretty painful for me and for my parents um, emotionally or physically emotionally uh, they you know that was it was really I mean that's like the very worst thing you could possibly do to a Muslim father is you know run around acting like a slut it doesn't go over real well hmm so that caused a lot of conflict in your house. Yeah, my uh, father, my mother says she doesn't remember this, but I pretty clearly remember a couple of times a year my whole family sitting down and my father would proclaim that I was a whore and he was disowning me and I wasn't his child anymore. And my mother would cry and my brother would oh. just kind of sit there. And yeah, so it wasn't a lot of real positive messaging around sexuality. One of my friends, Megan Tonjas, who I recorded with earlier this year in L.A., she was actually disowned by her dad. Oh, uh, that's horrible. And her mom has to sneak out, essentially, and visit her. Has to sn Her mom has to pretend she's doing something else so that she can go and visit her daughter. Yeah, my father was very protective. I can I can remember one situation. I was it was one of the times I had moved back home and some friends of mine lived a few blocks away and I was going to walk over there after dinner and he was like, "You can't do that. It's dangerous." And I'm just like, it, "We're in a very suburban neighborhood. You know, I used to live 
in a really sketchy neighborhood in San Francisco, Dad, I'm sure I'm going to be fine. Oh, no, 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 no. What if somebody like comes and pulls you in their car and drives off? And I'm like, ah, that's probably not going to happen to me. But, <laughs> you know, so he was he was coming from a place of love and protection. Uh, one of the central tenets of Islam is taking care of your family. That's a very, very important part of it. Mm. Were your parents affectionate? Yeah, they were. They definitely were. Uh, my mother is actually a child psychologist and ran a preschool for her university for many years. Um, she's kind of devoted her life to children. And yeah, she's she's very affectionate. My dad was somewhat affectionate when I was younger, but he's a little, he's spent a lot of time in his head. He's, he's actually dead now. But uh, yeah. Were they affectionate all to each other in front of you? A little bit. I mean, I have one of those proverbial stories about getting up to go to the bathroom in the middle of the night and seeing my parents having sex. I was probably <laughs> about 10 or 11. Shortly after that, they uh, got a deadbolt for their bedroom uh, door. Oh. You know, it's one of those things. I mean, you know, you obviously know if your parents have children that they had sex at least twice, right? Well, but did you know about that at that point? When when did you learn that there's this thing called sex and, and you had an experience of pleasure in your body that you related to that concept? Well, <laughs> <laughs> I actually, I was masturbating from a fairly young age and it, the way I did it was really funny. We had this chinning bar that was in the doorway between the living room and the kitchen. And I used to hang upside down with one knee over it and, you know, kind of holding on. And I'd kind of like, you know, press my legs together and like let my fingers almost come off of it. And so I would be doing that. And nobody, of course, knew what wait I was a doing. Wait a minute, wait a minute. So you mean a bar that you would use to do chin ups? Right. And I'd, so, so I'd you, stick you, one knee over you, it. You put your hands on it. Uh -huh. Then you swing your legs back. And put one knee over it, right? Uh huh. Yeah. So you've got so one like, knee hook. Yeah, one knee hooked, and then she's got a little figure one, four thing right, going on right like, now. Like like the hangman on the tarot deck. So, yes. Yeah. And then you know I just kind of be you cross your legs tightly, right? right? And you know be pressing my thighs together to to stimulate my. Uh, Genitalia. And so you were squeezing, essentially. Was, yeah, exactly. Because you would almost let your let Fe go, and then right. you would squeeze, and it would feel good. Yeah, yeah. And you could, could you bring yourself to climax that way? I think I was. I Wow. Yeah. I If I wasn't bringing myself to climax, I was at least, you know, kind of doing the, the waves of pleasure. That sounds like a lot of work. <laughs> uh, you know, you hear a lot about... You know, one of one of the theories is that or the reason that a lot of men are quiet when they're coming is because as a teenager, they had to yes. be quiet in their bedroom, in their bedroom so that they wouldn't get caught. Yes. And so, you know, I kind of wonder if, you know, part of the thrill was like, you know, my dad's sitting and watching TV, the news on TV and my mother's fixing dinner and, you know, I'm and doing nobody, this nobody knows. knows. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> So, uh, yeah, I was, you know, and I was interested in like, making out with boys when I was eight and things like that. You did know? you know what you were doing, though? Did you know what you were doing was masturbating? I don't know if I specifically knew that. I don't think I figured that out till later. I just knew that it felt really good. You know, some kids masturbate or, you know, play with themselves really young. Yeah. I, have, I know somebody who, you know, they had to, you know, get their kid when she was under a year old to, you know, you can't do that in front of everybody kind of thing, you know, because she was just doing it all the time. I, I think it's a way of self-soothing. Absolutely. That's really tough, though, right? Because that means that that the child has a physical almost imprint of this thing be not being okay. I think a lot of parents handle that by telling their kid just that it's private, yeah. just that they can't do it in public, but, you know, go ahead and go do it room. all you want in, in your bedroom. 
you know, because I mean, it wouldn't be appropriate for, you know, for us to be like sitting out at a cafe <laughs> with our hands <laughs> under the table and <laughs> playing with ourselves. You right. know, it's just not a good idea. It's right? not socially acceptable. Exactly. That's not likely to become so anytime soon. No, I don't <laughs> think so. <laughs> Unless you're Louis C.K., right? Oh, oh, still no. not even acceptable, no, no, right? No. Oh, yeah. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. So I don't want to get on a big tangent about that, but I did. Somebody made a post and said, you know, is this is this in the same realm? Is like, do we really consider him a Weinstein? And I don't consider him a Weinstein, yeah. but it's that it's an it's an interesting conversation about the degrees and, you know, enthusiastic consent is what was missing from this. Absolutely. Right? Yeah. So it's, it's what Dr. Jana says. And she said it on her Science of Sex podcast as well. Was she doesn't want to live in a world where where someone can't express a desire, you know, and make a, an invitation. But you have to know that if you have power over someone, that if they would fear to say no to you because of repercussions to their career or their life, it's then probably not such a great. It idea. It is not such a great idea. It is dangerous for them. Yeah, I mean, we're, as a society, I think it's time to be having a lot of conversations around boundary and consent, and it's just so frustrating that we don't teach that to kids when they're young and how to deal with rejection and mm -hmm. all these things. Recently, we had our, Hacienda has its own play party that's that's been going on for nine years, and then recently wow. just the villains, the people that I live with at the villa, that's what we call ourselves, nice. just the villains through their own party. And, and it was a rainbow and z rainbows and unicorns, rainbow playground themed. And myself and Morel, who's in the first episode, did the the intro and the consent speech and and some little icebreaker games. And we talked about you know, what is enthusiastic consent? What does it sound like? Yeah, I you know, think a it lot doesn't, of people don't know what it, it looks like. Yeah, it doesn't sound like, hey, could I touch your pussy? Sure. That might sound like consent, but it is not. It is not enthusiastic consent. And that is the bar at which I think we should all be playing. Again, we're not taught how to do it. We don't We don't learn it. So it's 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 hard for people to picture and then you know of course the media has so many examples of you know that you have to win the girl over and you know she she says she, says she doesn't no. want to but she really does and if yeah. you're just charming enough and persistent enough mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. exactly mm -hmm. i want to go back a little bit to the the learning about did you get the sex talk at home Kind of. I, I don't I don't remember. I mean, my my mother was fairly pragmatic with me. I mean, I, I had a boyfriend when I was about 15 or 16 and she marched me down to Planned Parenthood and put me on birth control. Mm. You know, she didn't want me screwing it up and getting pregnant. I think she'd seen a lot of that with, you know, kids in her school and um, work she had done with Head Start and so forth. You know, yeah. she she knew enough that you know, she didn't want me to screw up my future by having a kid as a teenager. Mm -hmm. My mom was, she was really sex positive. I just didn't have that word for it, you know, until recently. And she, she said, you know, sex is, is not dirty. It's something that happens between people who love each other. And then when I was in high school, she said, you know, I hope you won't have sex while you're in high school, but if you want to, I'll take you to get birth control and condoms and just just ask me. And then I didn't wind up having sex. I had oral sex in high school, and then I didn't wind up having penetrative penis and vagina sex until I was 19. I started when I was young. I lost my virginity a couple months into my freshman year in high school. I was 14 at the time. What's the story? Can you paint the picture? Oh, man. <laughs> uh, so there was a... a guy that had lived on the block behind me and we were kind of buddies and he, he was a couple of years older than me and then he had another friend and uh in Reno at the time there were all of these 
uh, it was called the pits and it was just kind of like areas where you kind of off-roaded in the foothills of the of Peavine Mountain and you know there was you know people would take their four-wheel drive trucks up there and all this stuff and is drive that, them around is that mudden no it's it wasn't mud it, you know it's it's the desert it's the desert so it's, it's pretty desert. dry so anyways I I one afternoon I went for a ride with the two of them and uh the one kid had this you know really nice mustang and so we mm -hmm. we go up there and um you know the three of us get out of the car and walk a little bit away and you know it's like they're i guess both gonna have sex with me and then they're like oh we should get a blanket and the guy walks back to the car and it turns out that he's like locked the keys in the car so <laughs> you know we can't you know then oh, it becomes no. about you know getting the keys out of the car so we end up, you know, we finally get this all to happen and it's getting late. So we drive back and I ended up having sex with the, the one guy, not the kid who lived behind me, but the other guy at his house. Um, and I don't remember it being super pleasant or, you know, it's just kind of like, yeah, what's the big deal about this? Mm -hmm. I had the same reaction. And from many people that I've talked to, that is fairly common. Yeah. I mean, you know, we weren't in love or you know, even boyfriend and girlfriend. So it's just kind of this thing that happened. And it wasn't super great. Was there the satisfaction of knowing that you had rebelled, that you were doing something transgressive? <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. And just kind of like, oh, okay, well, you know, I've, I've passed that, you know, big milestone in life. You know, now got that done. Got that done. <laughs> yeah, we can check that one off the bucket list. <laughs> Right. You know, which is kind of a big deal when you're a teenager. And then, of course, you know, like other girls were talking about me at school. And, you know, I was branded oh. a slut and, you know, all this stuff. How how did it reverberate through your social life? Mm, I wasn't a very popular kid to begin with. So, you know, I was I was a little bit estranged. I was one of the, the odd kids out with with most stuff. You know, a couple of the girls that I was friends with were pretty shocked and, you know, kind of judgy about it. And do you think those kids weren't having sex? I think they probably weren't. I, th I think they maybe waited and started a little bit later than I did. You know, I mean, 14 is not an uncommon age, but, you know, it's still on the early side. Well, I hope they've seen the error of their ways for shaming you. Yeah, I mean, you know, that was, what, the late 70s, so... 70s is supposed to be this incredibly liberal, swinging time, no? Mm, I lived in the, you know, I lived Reno. in Reno, so it wasn't a big city or anything. It was pretty provincial at the time. <laughs> so yesterday, I went to Justine's for dinner, and I was just poking around. I went all the way to the back, and there was this... It looked like a set, like a, a like movie set. Like stage area? And no, it was a 70s living room. And I read the plaque and it was 70s activist living room. And it was somebody doing a resist campaign. So giving out postcards and registering people to vote. And you would you could go in there and you could hang out and you could put on a record and and you know just feel into the groovy seventies vibe and take photos and write. Was that an is that an East installation? I think it is part of it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I think I I saw it on the thing. I, I was over by Justine's yesterday, but we didn't make it all the way down there. So which is like. Bushwick Open Studios or a gallery walk, right? You can just go into people's... Yeah, there's, yeah, there's like 500 open studios on the east side. I mean, there's just, there's tons of stuff even. Like, my neighbor is across the street. My other neighbors are around the corner. And, yeah, it's it's pretty cool. I feel like now, in terms of the, the sexual mores and the... My mom used to tell me, oh, it's always cyclical. So you have, you know, a generation that's more repressive, and then you have a wilder or or freer generation. I don't know. I mean, I think things are things are pretty hard right now for a lot of people sexually. I mean, it's it feels like it's open and free, but I think a lot of people are struggling with it. Only in certain pockets, I realize, does it feel that way. 
I just am fortunate to live in a community that <laughs> yeah, makes it feel that way. Definitely. I mean, I know I know a lot of people who really struggle with finding people that they want to have sex with. I struggle with finding people that I want to have sex with. Yeah, I've been going through that since I broke up with my boyfriend about six months ago. So it's something I wanted to talk to you about because I'm it's really become very clear to me on this trip, on this adventure. I mean, I'm traveling with all of these condoms and <laughs> And they're not getting used. <laughs> they're not getting used. Um <laughs> My ex-partner and I broke up in late spring. Yeah. And I have I had a sensation play extravaganza that was focused on me that was wonderful in which I received some oral sex. And then I had some oral and manual sex with a lover who was passing through town. And then I, I slept with an old lover of mine when I was in Portland. And other than that, it has been... Yeah, it's really challenging for me to find people that I'm attracted to enough to have sex with who are available to have sex or touch me, right? Mm -hmm. I seem to have a honing beacon for, I don't know, the young married men. There's this like type that I'm really drawn to. <laughs> I mean, I, I'm in my early 50s now and... Uh... I find that, you know, the, the guys that contact me off of my OK Cupid profile are either, you know, guys who are just like they're spamming everybody because they just want a girlfriend oh, who will so come gross. and take care of them and, you know, <laughs> cook them dinner and take care of their kids and stuff, which I'm not really into. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, like married guys, you know, who are like, oh, well, I'm married, but I'm like, no. Not people in an open relationship. People who want to fuck around. Yeah. Uh, you know, some of them might be in an open relationship, but at this point in my life, that just feels too complicated. I mean, I've had a few experiences with polyamory, and I was actually very good at it, but any relationship is like a part-time job. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I'm like, oh, yeah. I don't, I don't need, a, you know, to take on one that, you know, is actually two or three part-time jobs. It's unbelievable. Morel has so many relationship and lovers and partnerships going. I am astonished. I'm astonished. How can she show up for all of those things, you know, and and nurture all of those things? And it's because that's the most important thing to her. Yeah, I mean, a lot of people that I know who do pretty well with polyamory like don't work outside the home or something hmm. you know so they have all this time to to do all this stuff right because um, you have to invest time and energy and connection into it for things to to work to function absolutely and i think a lot of people are being left out of the way that we configure relationships right now i think doesn't necessarily work really well for a lot of people what do you think we can do one of the things that i found out so i've been spending about the past six to eight months working on a book and the current working title of it is somebody hold me the single person's guide to satisfying touch hunger i love the title somebody hold me thank you yeah i kind of workshopped that with a bunch of my girlfriends and you know people were like oh that's really good and it, it feels like you like know who i am inside my head you know mm. what i'm thinking <laughs> So, you know, the basic premise is, you know, that when you're when you're single and, you know, at this point, it's something I can't remember the exact statistic, but the last couple of censuses, it's been, you know, it's something like 46 percent of people in the United States say that they're single. And, you know, there's a lot of mm. needs that you can get met when you're single. I mean, I have amazing friends and we travel and we play and we have fun and we collaborate and we when you, support each other. But getting your touch needs met is hard next to impossible, you know, because we expect our romantic partners to meet all of our touch needs. When you say play, you don't mean sexually play, do you? No. Because people in my community often use play as a euphemism for sex. Yeah, no, 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 no. I've, I've, 
I know those people too. <laughs> <laughs> I've been to those kinds of play parties. Mm-hmm. No, I'm talking about you know, like going out, frolicking, and frolicking. <laughs> yes, okay, we can use frolicking. Yeah, that'll work. I, I love that word. <laughs> frolicking is a lovely word. Yes. So I think that touch is it's very fundamental. I mean, we. I think people are starting to pay more and more attention to to looking at it and going, oh, okay, you know, that's probably something that I don't have in my life. Uh, but at the same time, we don't really know how to get it because we expect that we're going to, you know, meet this person and fall in love and they're going to give us all the touch we want, which I you know, know from my other work that that doesn't always, it doesn't always happen that I way. I have never been in a relationship where I was touched as much as I wanted to be touched ever. My last relationship I was, I had, I had a lot of touch and a lot of sex and it was, it was good. So, mm. you know, I, I've kind of tackled this problem of, you know, how do you get your touch needs met when you're single? And it's hard. So. I get a massage once a week. From my amazing friend. And in my community, we hug each other a lot, which is lovely. And there are opportunities, right, at these play parties or cuddle parties. But because I am so incredibly selective about who I allow to touch me, which leads me to believe since I I hardly have memories before the age of 12 Uh and I was told many years ago many years later and many years ago right that my babysitter when I was a kid touched me inappropriately and I wonder if there's other other abuse in there because I am so I have a lot of sexual disgust and I I kind of like shiver with disgust whenever I hear about somebody engaging with a child inappropriately and so I I have such a visceral reaction Mm -hmm. and I am so very careful about who I allow to touch me and so particular and specific about who can touch me and how that I wonder if there's more abuse in my history than I remember that's it could very well be and that's a fairly common reason that I found where People are very, very touch sensitive and and selective about who touches them. That, you know, there was something that caused them a lot of distrust. Um, There's been, there's actually been a lot of conversation over the past year or so about parents like not forcing their kids to sit on laps right? or, or to hug people you yeah. know and and people are like but it's their grandparents yeah. and it's like well you know if the kid doesn't you know it, you know you may be close to your parents because you grew up with them but if they live on the other side of the country you know the kid doesn't know their grandparent and you know it's like give them a little bit of time and you know that's another a situation where there's a power differential, right? Yes, absolutely. You know, and some adults understand that, you know, and then there's other adults who are like, you know, well, life's all about having to do things that you don't necessarily want to mm. do. And it's like, but you're teaching your kids not to have bodily autonomy and yeah. not to trust their own intuition about who feels safe and who doesn't. Because mm. at its core, touch is really about feeling safe. We evolved both as a species and both in our individual human development with touch. You know, when we were, you know, when human beings first came onto the scene, you know, we would sleep in large clumps in caves and we did it for two reasons, one for warmth and two for safety. And it's the same thing when you're born, you first learn about safety in your parents' arms. You know, that's where, you learn to feel secure and cared for and safe. And so touch is, is so fundamental and so intertwined into our biology that the fact that we have a lot of people in the world now who don't have it and don't have opportunities to get it, I think, contributes to a lot of feelings of that we don't belong, that we're not seen, Mm -hmm. that we're not important, that we're not part of the tribe, um, that we're not cared for. 
It's something that's very simple, but it's important. But profound. Simple, but profound. Absolutely. I haven't been able to quite untangle this just yet. I've been thinking about it for many years. So I can't remember a time when I wanted my mother's touch. Mm -hmm. And she would say in kind of a, I remember her saying it, I'm going to ask her about it when I see her, in kind of a complaining way, like you, you were very particular, you know, you, you didn't want to sit on, you know, certain people's laps. And I think, you know, go me that I was discerning and said no and, you know, drew boundaries. And I don't think she was somebody who would try to force me because she had been sexually abused, but she had gone looking for, her father never touched her. And she longed for male touch so much that she went to, I think, friends of the family to get her touch needs met. And I think she was so scared that I would have some kind of similar abuse experience that she made sure I was never alone with men. And then ironically, who touched me but my female babysitter? Uh, yeah, I mean, we, we, we often, you know, attribute unwanted or, you know, touch to, to men. But yeah, women, not only women men. do it too. It's not only men. I, I know people who are, you know, they're just... They're such touch enthusiasts. Like I'm thinking of somebody that I met recently and a friend was introducing us. And so we were chatting over text message and we made an arrangement to meet. And I walk in and this person just like grabs me and gives me a big hug. And, you know, I'm a fairly huggy person, but I was just like, whoa, Mm -hmm. lady, you're like not paying attention to, Mm -hmm. you know, not reading the. Not reading the room. (laughs) Yeah. And, you know, that's just the way that she is. And, you know, I I know that she means well, she's not trying to do it. But, you know, I mean, people definitely have, like, people have different sex drives, they kind of have different touch drives. Yeah. And I think what's interesting is that I am extremely sensual and extremely touch oriented. But people will experience me in one of two ways. I'll either seem totally standoffish to them because I don't want to touch them or have them touch me, or I'm incredibly warm, incredibly loving, super touchy. Well, the one, one of the things that I've found is that, you know, I mean, we can sit here and talk about how wonderful touch is until we're blue in the face, but if it's not consensual, it won't feel good. If you don't want to be touched, then it actually can do more damage. You know, one of the things that, touch does for people on a physiological level is it relaxes you. I mean, I've, one of the things that I've noticed in with Karuna sessions is that, uh, which we'll talk more about in a bit, but, Mm -hmm. you know, people will get to this place about 10 minutes in, you know, seven minutes in where it's like, you can feel all the little micro muscles in their body relaxing. Mm. And, Touch is is supposed to make you feel safe and make you feel good. But if you don't want to be touched, it's exactly the opposite. Your body Mm -hmm. tenses up and you get into fight or flight mode. And we have so many opportunities to do that in our world as it is, you know, to, to be on guard and be alert and be tense that, you know, I would like to see us create a culture where touch does exactly the opposite, where, you know, it is a place for people to get relaxed and feel safe and feel cared for and feel like they belong. And My mom needs that desperately. She is running on an extreme touch deficit. She hasn't had a boyfriend or someone to embrace her since I was studying abroad in Amsterdam in 2002 and her ex-boyfriend killed himself, oh, drowned himself in oh. the pool, and she found him. Oh so God. she has not had a partner since then. And she's very, she's Brazilian. She's very gregarious and very touchy and very warm. And she needs attention and affection and has not received it. So she's running on such a deficit and she would love for me to be affectionate with her, to sit and hug her on the couch, to embrace her. And I want to want to, 
because I know it would be so healthy for her and because she's 76 and I don't know how much longer she's going to be around. And I'm trying to parse out in myself what it's about to see if I can shift it because I also don't want to do it if I don't want to do it because that right. doesn't that doesn't seem positive for anybody if I fake it. I maybe got – my mom was sick. She, she had colon cancer when I was seven, eight, and nine. So she was in, the, in and out of the hospital, and, and I wanted a brother, and they, they, she, she had a miscarriage, and she lost a baby, mm. and she's manic depressive, and so she's had these depressive episodes, and she's a very anxious person. Uh-huh. I've had a very fraught and challenging relationship with her. I think since we moved to Florida, since my parents got divorced when I was 12, and I wonder if I am still holding so much resentment and anger. Because she couldn't be the mother that you needed her to be. Yeah. And I'm 35 now, so, you know, she's just a human being. (laughs) I would like to forgive her for doing the best that she could and not and not being maybe what was what I wanted or hmm. but I I don't I don't know how to how to bridge the gap let it go or I get so annoyed with her and I feel so ashamed for her. How little I enjoy her company when she loves me so much and she's so alone. I don't know. I don't know how to shift it. Mm, That sounds really hard. I know she's tried to get me to fill an empty space inside her and I actually had a very, very honest conversation with her in the past year where I said, you know, I, I said, I sometimes push back because I know I can't, I can't be that for you. And she said, I don't expect you to, but, but she's so lonely. She's like everything I'm afraid to be, everything I never want to be. But she, I can see her qualities and her attributes and what I got from her. She's incredibly artistic temperament and she's gregarious and she's charismatic. She's charming. And I want to be able to love her. It's like... It's so much pressure to feel like I'm the only person she's got. And then I feel so, so guilty. And it doesn't help anything, but I feel so guilty. It's a lot to unpack. And I've kind of just committed to speaking to her once a week, you know, over FaceTime so she gets to see me. But I, I usually don't enjoy it. And they just do it out of obligation. Hmm. So I know that you're on your way to see her yeah. this week. Could you think about doing something for her or with her that doesn't necessarily involve holding her, like brushing her hair or rubbing her feet? Or um... I could give her a Thai body work session. Mm, that might be a little bit intense for her. I know that Thai body work can be pretty heavy duty if she's... I um, could do it gently. Yeah, or... But, you know, so, something that, you know, that puts some some distance, you know, like giving her a pedicure or something. Mm. Um, let's, let's do face masks together. Or, you know, there's a lot of ways to share a touch that we would have done when we were you know, back a hundred years, you know, when we didn't have people to go to, to cut our hair, you know, like women would be braiding each other's hair and brushing each other's hair and things like that. Maybe a hand massage. Yeah, exactly. So that she still gets a little bit so that you can try and approach her a little softly. Does she know 
all of this stuff that you've just told me? Yes, I think so. Hmm. I I did sit down with her the last time I saw her and and say that I thought maybe I was holding some anger and resentment from these things and sometimes when I bring it up she says oh let's just not it's too much it's too much for right now let's just not talk about it and what I hope to do this time is to sit down with her and just for myself record me asking her questions about her life Mm. and asking her questions about my life what she remembers about me that I don't remember because I'm not utilizing that um, gift of memory that she has and she has a good memory yeah it's a good time to 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 capture her life it sounds like Oh, that's such a that's such a hard position to be in. I also There's... don't have if something happens to her, I don't have money to support her. You mm, know. That's that's rough as well. No idea what Yeah, we've we've created a culture where we don't and we can't take care of each other. It's really hard. And I I want I keep nudging her, but she's so resistant to move into a community of people over 65 and I don't understand I mean for many years she said oh they're too they're really too old for me the people who live there but now she's she's 76 and they're not too old for her and I know she needs community and I know she's a person who used to thrive in community Mm -hmm. her college life and the kind of expat people that she gathered for potlucks and and things like that and and I believe it would be such an improvement to her quality of life and she's seen how incredible it's been for me in the three and a half years that I've been living in community we're very similar similarly made but I can't push her to do anything that she's not going to do not ready to do when we used to live in multi-generational households Mm -hmm. uh you know, elderly people would get a lot of their touch needs met from, you know, taking care of the kids. I mean, my my mother takes care of her granddaughter a lot. And, you know, my my niece is very, very huggy and stuff. And, yeah, that's where my mother's getting her touch needs met because she's she's been a widow for close to 10 years now and doesn't seem to have any interest in being with somebody else. So, yeah, that might be a good idea. Maybe, you I don't know, maybe it would be worth it to go see if you can check a couple places out with her. I mean, you know, she may have changed her. You know, maybe she's feeling more like she can be in community. She doesn't want to leave her house. She doesn't want to sell her house. And that's the oh. only way she could do it. Could she run it out? I don't know. I know that she doesn't want to. <laughs> yeah. She's stubborn, it sounds yes. like. Yeah. <sighs> yeah. So. Yeah, it's, that's, it's pretty heartbreaking for both of you, it sounds like, for different reasons. Yeah. That, that you both want something that the gap just can't be bridged by where where you're at and And it is better than it used to be and every time I I go back I think well I'm gonna it's gonna be better this time and it is better it's just not lovely or you know I I know I shouldn't compare my insides to other people's outsides but I know I see people posting like I I just have the best mother in the world. Dear ones, did you know that I send what I call missives to my email list once a week-ish? They include my personal writing, resources from the episodes, links, videos, saucy photos, and other miscellaneous bits of ephemera like articles about my sex-positive intentional community. To receive all that goodness directly in your inbox, 
sign up on horizontalwithlila.com and add lila at horizontalwithlila.com to your address book for good measure. I've heard that my missives have gotten buried in some sort of updates or promotions tab in Gmail, or even that they've gone to spam. They are not spam. Please rescue them. Season two has been edited by Chad Michael Snavely. Check out his slew of podcasts on chadmichael.com. Shauna Shea drew my sensual, colorful cover art, and you can hire her through 99designs. And the rock star slash father, Alan Markley, created my intro music. He's Plastic Cannons on Instagram. In next week's episode, the second part of my conversation with Epiphany, we talk about her forthcoming book, Somebody Hold Me, about getting your touch needs met, single and not, about what exactly is involved in a Karuna session, and about getting together to cuddle your friends. Until next time, may you have someone to love, something to do, and something to look forward to. Thanks for getting horizontal. Stay away. I have sweet blood. They love me. Stay away from me. Yeah, you're going to be like a buffet here in Texas. No. (laughs) No, I want to move here. Don't say that. (laughs) Oh, my God. Everybody wants to move here. Don't tell anybody that you want to move here. Uh.